The first announcement I have to make is a, a sad one that unfortunately because of the uh, cancellation of his plane, Professor Novak will be unable to join us uh, today. Uh, so that is a loss for uh, the conference. Uh, but we still have 10 fantastic speakers. Not 10 more fantastic speakers, uh, but uh, 10 uh, uh, in total. And the, uh, the excellent uh, discussion we had before lunch uh, on the, uh, the co uh, for many I think, unexpectedly complex uh, relations between Poles, Czechs uh, and Slovaks during the First World War and throughout the interwar period, and even into the Second World War, uh, is now uh, to find a, a, an equivalent in the perhaps even more complex situation in the East. Uh, it is often forgotten that we're not simply talking about the west of the Russian Empire. No, we're not simply talking about Ukraine and Belarus. The broader historical context here is the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, uh, which was partitioned along with the rest of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth at the end of the 18th century. There is a regional specific here, which leads to other kinds of uh, con uh, conflicts, uh, which can be compared and contrasted uh, with those in the South. Now, the uh, first paper uh, will be given uh, by uh, Professor Joanna gierowska Kawo uh, of the History Institute of the Polish Academy uh, of Sciences in Warsaw. The title of her paper is Death, Agony and Birth Pangs, Inheritors of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, under German occupation, 1915 to 1918. And this will be something of a digest of her very latest research, which promises to challenge established views uh, on the situation in that part of the world. So thank you very much for coming, Professor. Thank you. Uh, for 124 years, the Polish populace in all three partitions uh, shared the hope that historical justice would one day be satisfied and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth resurrected. The German authorities treated the Poles differently, depending on the which part of the former Commonwealth, Commonwealth uh, they lived in. Long before the outbreak of the First World War, Germany's principal nuisance in its eastern territories was the Polish population on the Prussian, uh, Prussian uh, partition. The Polish residents of the areas conquered in 1915 were seen as two separate groups strictly, strictly uh, isol isolated and treated differently. Poles from the Kingdom of Poland and Lithuanian Poles from the Oberost area with Vilnius and Grodno. In February 1918, during the break off in the Burst talks, the Germans have managed to move the German Soviet front line, placing in, in the inhabitants of lands so far beyond the reach of German, German politics under the, its uh, direct influence. In the part of the former Grand Duchy of Lithuania occupied by the Germans, uh, tri uh, traces, traces of an evident Lithuanian movement of national rev revival were already visible back, back in the mid 19th century. Nevertheless, from an objective point of view, their demands addressed to Russian Minister Witte asking for Vilnius to become exclusive property of Lithuanians were rather odd, since the number of Lithuanians res uh, residing. Oh. My day, my day. <laughs> Excuse me. The fifth, first, and uh, the uh, since the number of Lithuanian residents in this city didn't uh, entitle them to claim, all censuses, both Russian and newer German ones, proved the number of Lithuanians in Vilnius was negligible. Also, the relatively large number of Belarusians shown in the statistics might be mi mis misleading. This destination would be applied not only to the few ambitious Belarusian leaders, but also to illiterate physical laborers 
oblivious, oblivious that, to the Belarusian issue, who flocked to the city from the all over white Ruthenia to work on the construction of the municipal waterworks. The German historian and politician Hans Delbrück said, it is the censuses, See, seven and the eight wasn't because uh, Lituan Council don't agree. Uh, German historian and politician Hans Dörbrück uh, um, said, Lithuania, uh, Vilnius is the most exceptional city in the world. It is the capital of Lithuania. It is located on Belarusian la land and inhabited by Polish and Jews. On the other hand, it has almost no Lithuanian residents, maybe three on hundred. For Poles, Vilnius is next to Kraków, their most important cultural center, even more so than Warsaw. Vilnian Poles thus perceived reality through the lens of their city, which is unusually ethnic distribution, so much different from the rest of the former Grand Duchy of Lithuania. The German policies were consistently aimed at dividing the territory of the former Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. From the beginning of the occupation, the German authorities pursued outstandingly anti-Polish and only secondarily pro-Lithuanian and pro-Belarusian strategy. In order to attain effective conquest and both political and economic domination, the Germans needed to antagonize individual ethnic groups active in the area. Control, of the, control the sentiments of Lithuanian Poles and exploit the political ambition of nationalists other than Polish. The history of the Oberost area can be divided into several peri periods. The first one from September 1915 to the proclamation of the Act of 5th November 1916. It may, not, it may not have been the Germans who caused the hostile behavior of the local Belarusian and Lithuanian leaders towards the Polish Democrats of Vilnius, who objectives to the co-opting of the spokesman of Polish Democrats, Aleksander Szklennik, to the Kaunas Vilnius Civic Committee, in spite of these friendlies towards them. But it was the Germans who, having I did uh, identified the national potential of the lands of the former Grand Duchy of Lithuania in February 1916, resorted to limit the cultural and educational ambition of local Poles and supported in a bluntly protectionist man manner the requests of Lithuanian and Belarusian leaders. Rittmeister Beckerat, uh, dismissed from Vilnius on May 19, uh, Uh, Vilnius uh, uh, in his memo memorandum telling conclusion. In any case, I consider in, uh, it inappropriate to exclude the entire Polish population from taking part in governing the country and to disaffect them with the German rule by means of decisions seen by them as biased. Thus, thus pushing them towards recognizing with the Polish nation state, which is be to established after the war after the war. Ludendorff, however, saw no reason to modify the principle adopted so far. On 26 May 1916, Wilhelm Feldman wrote in report from Berlin, Ludendorff is doing politics in Polish, Lithuanian, Belarusian matters, an intricate and largely ignored effort, rarely covered by the press. The act of the 5th November 1916 was a deploy Considered, considered and highly effective tactical move of the German side differ, uh, directed against the Poles. Formally, it didn't cover the lands of the former Grand Duchy of Lithuania, whose fate was determined only six months after the outbreak of the February Revolution on the so-called September Act of Prince Leopold of Bavaria. The Act of 5th November had two sides. First, the commonly acknowledged one, in undoubtedly facilitated the laying of the foundation for Polish statehood and brought the Polish cause onto the international scene. 
The second site of the act, the 5th November, was the creation of the Polish Piedmont in Warsaw for the Poles from the Oberost area. The Vilnian Poles, tired of the German policies of constant repression and confiscation, effectively demotivated in their education, educa uh, education efforts, frustrated by the support provided to analogies, Lithuanian and Belarusian in initiatives, or simply hungry, welcomed enthusiastically the creation of the Polish state in Warsaw. They shift the burden of moral and, body, and many, any other responsibility for their fate to the Polish politician in Warsaw. Anonymous declaration of demands of incorporating Vilnius, Vilnius into Poland were issued and sent to Warsaw from all parts of Lithuania. The willingness to cooperate with the leaders of the other communities of the Grand Duchy had effectively expired. Obviously, this turn of events must have been concerning for the representatives of other ethnic groups. The situation was even worsened by the mass departure of the most active and motivated among the Lithuanian Poles towards to the to Kingdom of Poland. Michał Romert uh, noted that intelligentsia left Vilnius in large numbers, mostly from the legal and medical fields, all pro-independence -indep activists and progressives. On 9th November 1916, Batman Holweg allegedly declared For the sake of the Eastern Campaign, we had to resort to a diplomatic ruse. The proclamation of Poland will ensure the submissiveness submis of Poles, fill the gaps and, uh, in our regiments, allow us to introduce new taxes, and finally, empower us in governing this country. Indeed, we alone must rule over the newly created Poland. Any other solution is out of the question. The territories lying to the east, cast, uh, to the east are ideal for future colonization, at which, with God's will, we shall succeed. Bredrich Kurmalen, uh, Bredrich Kurmalen uh, author of the 1916 work Das Neue Ostland, summarized the German policy as follows. While it's important that, that uh, Poles be freed from the Russian yoke for all times, but it is necessary for them to understand that they shall obtain independent rule of, uh, over Congress Poland only if this will not contradict in the interest of the German state in any way. After the February Revolution, an entire, uh, entirely a different political uh, line from the expected by Lithuanian Poles was proposed to them, to them by the Lithuanian Commission in Warsaw, established besides the Provincial Council of State in response to the latter's lack of power in matters of Lithuania and Belarus. Between 19 and, uh, second, uh, and 22 May uh, 1917, all political parties and milieus of kingdom have then demanded of, on behalf of the population of the resurrected Polish state, the creation of an independent entity for the lands of, of the former Grand Duchy of Lithuania as well. The declaration stated that Poland would uh, steadfastly strive to reestablish a relationship with independent Lithuania in the firm belief that uh, the voluntary and consensually uh, merger of both states would bring the peoples of Lithuania, peoples of Lithuania, this is Lithuanians, Poles, and Belarusians, national security for the cultural and economic development of all social strata. This statement came as a surprise for the Poles of Vilnius. They had a completely different perception of the reality around them. So far, they had been uh, witnessing the appeals of Lithuanian and Belarusians to the German authorities, uh, result in tangible profits for these communities. Consequently, the Polish activists to decide to turn to the German authorities in order to defend their his own interests. Perhaps they thought 
that such a move would fit Warsaw activist policy towards Germany. On the 24 May 1970, this one week, proclaimed the famous Vilnius Memorandum signed by 44 representatives of all faction, uh, faction of the Polish political scene of the Lithuania, including diocesan administrator Michalkiewicz. The signing of the memorandum corresponded with the interest of the Germans, who consequently pursued a policy of uh, unhitling uh, the significance of Poles on, and Polishes in the territories that they intended to monopolize, monopolize, if not colonize, economically and politically. Sorry. Lacking support from the kingdom and having uh, realized that German policies towards the Polish community would not change, the police from Lithuania turned their hopes towards their peers in Galicia. Galician politicians did make the most of their possibilities, but the potential implementation of the Austro-Polish-Hungarian concept would also result in the further dismemberment of the lands of the former Grand Duchy. The year 1917 was a time when the German authorities would largely exploit the ambition of the Lithuanians and Belarusian politicians based in Vilnius. They would establish nation states in the territories that they occupied on the ruins of the former Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Besides Jews, the only community that was not taken into account by the Germans in the creation of these state-like ent entitles were the Poles. The core of the Lithuanian state was formed with strong German support. The most similar the um, Belarusian state within the borders of the Oberost area was to follow. On the 4 August 1917, began the talks of Lithuanian 22 with the representatives of the German authorities regarding the shape of the future Lithuanian state. Initial uh, guidelines were discussed. Lithuanians agree, uh, agreed to the, that the country joined the German Empire as a federal state and were promised the proclamation of Vilnius as an ethnographic capital of the Lithuania. At the same time, the German authorities carried out of serious searches among Polish priests and social activists, as well as Polish print houses and editors, effectively terrorizing the Polish society and discrediting the Polish clergy. Lithuanians requested the removal of the Polish diocesan administrator. The proceeding of the Lithuanian conference ultimately began on 18 September and were confidential, the doors were closed and the, to, the, uh, to the press and to the public. In initially, the attitudes of the participants were clearly anti-German. However, the third day of the conference saw the arrival of several young Lithuanians from Switzerland, together with Reverend Olszewski, known for his uh, hostile attitude toward Poles. The arrivals from Switzerland claimed the uh, government of the coalition states and anonymously desired to recreate Poland as strong as possible, almost as, uh, as it was before the partitions, which already amounted one, uh, one, one They uh, mm, influenced the attitude of the Congress towards Lithuanians' relations with the German right. Almost at the same time, the Vilnian Belarusian to go that their chance from the Germans. On 8 September 1917, a political meeting of Belarusian activists took place with German uh, consent. During the debate, on, uh, only six out uh, six of uh, the 72 attendants spoke in favor of relying on the Polish side. Two more Belarusian rallies took place in the first of the, in the second decade of the October uh, eight, 1917. On 18 October, the German authorities allowed another Belarusian Congress. However, the Belarusian leaders from Vilnius were not able to take advantage of this, of he, this opportunity. Of course, the Polish activists too soft the consent of the Ober -Ost, uh, of Ober -Ost authorities to convene a Congress, alas, to no avail. They witnessed powerlessly the successes of Lithuanian and Belarusian politicians from Vilnius who were faithful and obedient to the Germans. Mutual animosities increased. Under the influence of a small yet active uh, group of Polish national lobbyists, the Lithuanian Poles 
began the, to express strong reluctance against both the Lithuanian national movement and the local Belarusian activists. The Lithuanian and Belarusian leaders, on the other hand, saw their chance in the destruction of what the poles of all affiliations we should to rebuild in harmony. It was practically too late for a, a rational and logical decision. And those among the Poles who were able to form a sober judgment of the situation have already lost their say earlier, and this uh, by the hands of the Lithuanian and Belarusian politicians whom they had been supporting. The political situation during the talks in the Brest was masterfully exploited by the Lithuanian politicians. On 11 December 1917, the Tariba proclaimed independence through as, uh, an act remained faithful and submissive to Germany. As a sign of protest, several Lithuanian politicians withdrew from the council and decided to side with the Poles in Vilnius. According to Jonas Vilaitis, the Lithuanians had sent through the Germans' game who ca uh, cared uh, for the Lithuanian declaration only as far as they needed it for the negotiation in Brest. Lithuania's fake independence was to be proclaimed, as the speaker put it, on page three on the, of the newspaper, and was to be, to be an literal act without seeking recognition from Germany. The Lithuanians issued a number of new demands to the German side and decided to hold a joint conference of all nationalities or to supplement the council. The Polish delegation presented its stand. It is difficult to determine to what extent the decision, Lithuanian decision was uh, dictated by a real desire to reach a consensus with the Polish side and to what extent it was calculated to uh, exert pressure on German politicians. What is known is uh, that Lithuanian politicians used Kuhlmann's Brest Ruse and forced the, Ger the German Chancellor to replace the pseudo independence adapted on 11 December with actual true Lithuanian independence, uh, 17 February 1918. They removed the paragraphs confirming the official lack of uh, sovereignty of their country and the German Constantin. Germany's plan of fragmentation of the Fermon Commonwealth society fell in line with the intentions of Lithuanian politicians, laboriously establishing their national state. The Lithuanians simply knew how to take advantage of it. One, oh, whoa. <laughs> On the eve of the talks with the Soviet in Brest, in response to the political situation, and which the knowledge of the, and consent of the German authorities, Kazimierz Schaffnagel published in Haumann a series of articles under a common title to our national intelligentsia. An organizing com committee was established in the convention and El all Belarusian national conference, including representatives from all occupied Belarusian lands. In return for their support, the German authorities proposed that Belarusians submit them a memorandum asking them to convince the Russian peace delegation to enable the immediate disarmament of the Polish troops of Dobur Bushnitsky, currently stationed in the Minsk region. By all votes, save two, Światopolbirski and Wastowski, the committee passed a resolution confirming the submission of the memorandum, which contained an official protest against the occupation of Belarus lands by Poles and demanded, demanded and, and it was protest. <sighs> the following months of uh, 1918 brought a, not only a military defeat for Germany, but also the outcome the German, uh, the German uh, divided at impera policy. Following the proclamation of proper independence by Lithuania and uh, convening the third Hamota uh, of the People's Republic of Belarus, 25 March uh, up, uh, past uh, Brest, uh, 1918, the Polish residents, the former Grand Duchy of Lithuania, experienced a poignant sense of defeat and underserved harm, if not their demise. They now feared not only the Bolsheviks, but also the co of the former Grand Duchy of Lithuania. The Germans had achieved their goal to block the restitution of the Commonwealth. 
The wishes of the Lithuanian and Belarusian leaders in Vilnius fell perfectly in line with the primary intention of the German occupiers, who thus succeeded, succeeded at preventing the restitution of the Union Lublin in its modern 20th century form, whilst of the Lithuanians benefited whereas the Lithuanian benefited from this uh, by, by gaining independence. This, however, at the cost of the Polish e efforts to restore this Eastern European Union, which was the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Thank you. Excuse me. Personal uh, histories uh, and uh, the and particular lived lifetimes, and so remaining within the general uh, uh, geographical area of the former Grand Duchy uh, of Lithuania, uh, we now have the opportunity to follow the experiences of the Protasevich family of Borki, uh, and our guide in this uh, will be Dr. Hubert Zavadsky, and I'll just give him a little plug here. Uh, the third edition of the Cambridge Concise History of Poland is in preparation, and I hope it will be out very soon. It is, in my view, the best single-volume history of Poland in any language. Thousands of families across the lands of the former Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth were affected by the First World War, by the Russian Revolution and the Polish Soviet War that followed, and by other border conflicts. Lives were lost and lives were disrupted. People had to flee war zones. There, were military, there was military requisitioning and deprivation. There were epidemics. Often there was chaos and anarchy. Each affected family of whatever social standing would have a story to tell. My focus today is on the landed gentry in what is in what in interwar Poland was the northeastern Kresy, the northeastern borderlands, the district of Sonim in the province of Novogrudek, before 1914 the Grodno-Gubernia in the Russian Empire, and on one representative family from that district, the Protasevichs of Borki, and. Right, and here is a, a map which shows you the international borders of 1914, um, and in, in this pink color are the territories of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth before <coughs> 1772, and there you have the location of Borki. This today is, of course, Belarus. Not all landed families of the area had the same experiences, but theirs was probably untypical. I would like to explore two themes, main themes. One is the physical impact of war and its consequences for people and places. And secondly, the responses to altered political circumstances, the end of the Russian Empire after 120 years, the threat of Bolshevism, and the reemergence of a Polish state. First, where and who? We've located the place on the big map, and here is the Bartosiewicz uh, home, uh, a 17th century wooden manor in a place called Borki, 30 kilometers north of Slonim, the main town of the region. Uh, Melchior Vankovic, the writer, a visitor between the wars, was to describe the manor in lyrical terms. The ethnic and religious composition of the district's population was highly diverse, mostly Belarusians, many Jews, and Poles. Most of the landed gentry were Polish or Polonized, uh, or, or Polonized um, uh, descendants of the old Rus-Lithuanian boyars. The village of Borki was predominantly Orthodox, but some neighboring villages were Roman Catholic. It's important to note also that serfdom in this part of the Russian Empire only ended in 1861. 
same year as slavery in the US, I believe. At the beginning of the 20th century, this part of the Russian Empire was still an overwhelmingly rural area, world with few railways, poor roads, extensive forests, and a population with many pockets of illiteracy, uh, very different from <coughs> the western areas of former Poland. The Protosevichs were descendants of old Orthodox Rus boyars and nobility of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. They were widely settled across what today is Belarus. The family produced two distinguished churchmen in the 16th century. Jonas, the Orthodox Metropolitan of Kiev, a direct ancestor of the Protosevichs of Borki, uh, he was a widower when he was appointed to the clerical office, and his distant cousin Valerian, the Roman Catholic Bishop of Vilno. I refer to Vilno rather than Vilnius, with apologies to Lithuanians here. By the 17th century, most of Jonas's descendants were Roman Catholic and Polonized in culture, but very conscious of their roots in the Grand Duchy. At the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, the Protasevichs of Borki were a large family, which meant a wide variety of experiences in 1914 to 21. Uh, this is a very simplified uh, family tree with many people left out, but we have Eustachy Protasevich and his wife, Apolonia Zhuravska. They had uh, 10 surviving children. Uh, uh, these are the daughters with a married name, Marina Shvetskevich, Salma Polubinska, Yuzefa Kochan, Avarista Pshubitko, sons, Vatsnov, uh, Wilhelm, who had four sons, Piotr, Narcis, son, Leos, Antoni, and Leon. Um, life in the Russian Empire up to 1914, the background. The family was very conscious of its earlier history within the Grand Duchy and Poland, Lithuania. They were very conscious of their Schlachter traditions. They referred sometimes to the region as part of Litva, in the sense of the multi-ethnic historic Grand Duchy. For them, Minsk was Minsk Litevsky. There's a revealing inscription on a photograph from 1907 of the very close Zhulavsky relatives who lived very near Lida, just north of Borki. I'd like to show it to you. Uh, here are the uh, ladies uh, of in, in Venzhovchizna, uh, near Lida, but this is, uh, this is 1907, and this is interesting inscription here, Krulevianki na Litvie, royal princesses in Lithuania. So there's no problem about being Polish in culture and being Lithuanian, at least living in what you think is Lithuania. But for over a century, since 1795, they had to face the realities of life under Russian rule. They were certainly not servile in their attitude. During the 1863-64 insurrection, anti-Zarist insurgents were sheltered in Borki, for which the family was subsequently heavily fined. But they had to survive within the Russian Empire and retain their social and legal status as Dvaryanya. So uh, however much they cherished the Polish, Lithuanian, and Roman Catholic identity, they had to be pragmatic in their dealings with the Tsarist order. A large family with many heavy financial obligations did create challenges. The eldest son, Václav, took over the running of the estate in 1896, but several of his sisters still needed dowries, these are the old days, and several brothers had to be educated and had to be found suitable livelihoods. And here's a photograph uh, at the, at, um, in front of Borki uh, before 914, um, here is uh, Vatsov, the sort of head of the family. His brothers, Antoni and uh, uh, Piotr Antoni and Leon. Uh, Antoni wearing his in the Russian uniform. Um, this is the family of Wilhelm, who is not here. These boys here, they'll reappear in our story. Uh, this is a visiting, visiting Russian officials here. Fortunately, Vatsov was energetic and enterprising. He established a successful starch processing plant and a carp farm on the estate. He was even awarded a Tsarist gold medal for his achievements. But he certainly didn't want to be killed during the Russo-Japanese War and skillf skillfully avoided being called up. It's amazing what you could do with, with a few rubles in Russia in those days. <laughs> uh, it became a bad habit, I'm afraid, too. <laughs> Uh, the family on the eve of the First World War was scattered because of marriage and professional work. By 1914, all four sisters were married and, and had, some had families of their own. 
And here are the uh, sisters. There's Marinia, who's the eldest. Uh, there's Salomea here with her husband. There's Yusufa Kotran and Evarista uh, Tributka with her husband. I don't imagine she traveled on a tram with that hat. But <laughs> uh, two of them lived in Vilno. That's Marinia Svitskevich and Salomea. Uh, Yusufa Kotran uh, had recently returned from Manchuria, where her husband was building railways. And Evarista, on the extreme right, lived near Lida. Of the six brothers, only two remained in the district. The eldest, Václav, married to Zofia Żurawska, was running the Borki estate, and Piotr, who had inherited a smaller Protasevich estate nearby. But three brothers, lovely names, Wilhelm, Narcis, imagine calling somebody Narcis, Narcissus, and Antoni, had received a technical education and were working on railway construction in Siberia, where opportunities to make a fortune were great during a period of economic growth in Russia. Go east, young man, one would say. Wilhelm was a graduate of the prestigious Institute of Roads and Communication in Moscow, even had his own railway construction company east of Novosibirsk, while his wife and family lived in Vilna and spent some summers in Borki. It is worth bearing in mind, one often forgets this, that many thousands of Poles lived and worked in the Russian interior. It is estimated that in 1914, 60,000 Poles lived in St. Petersburg alone. But the situation of the youngest brother, Leon, could, have, could not have been more different. There he is, a hunting scene. By the early 1900s, uh, the family finances had improved and Leon, the youngest, was able to study at the Lvov Polytechnica in Austrian Galicia. There in Lvov, he was exposed to modern political and social ideas and joined Pilsudski's pro-independence movement. Unlike his eldest brother, Václav, who was born seven years after the end of serfdom and still held very old attitudes on social issues, Leon, by contrast, much younger, could be labeled a progressive democrat. World War I and the Polish-Soviet War. As we have heard on several occasions, the German arms offensive in the East in 1915 brought the war into the western gubernia of the Russian Empire, modern Lithuania and Belarus. To escape the advancing front, Evarista Trebitko, the youngest of the siblings, moved to Minsk, which was still on the Russian side, while Wilhelm's wife plus their four sons left Vilno for Moscow. Here they are in Moscow, 1915. Um, there's Vatsov, came to visit them. Wilhelm is here, the great railway builder, his wife, Zofia Stabrowska, and the sons, Zygmunt, watch his name, that's Apollonius, Stefan, and Polly, Apollonius. Sorry, that's, that's ca casual, Casimir. The, some landowners managed to stay behind, but others, including Vatsov, were pressured by the authorities to leave. In September 1915, Václav and his wife Zofia and their two young daughters left Borki for Taganrog on the Sea of Azov, where they remained until 1918. And this is a photograph taken there uh, in, in Taganrog. Much of the family's fortune was exhausted as a result. Václav tried to make ends meet by starting a business there and also went in early 1916 to Petrograd to claim the promised compensation for the losses incurred by the family. Vatsov's family was in Tachanrog during the 1917 February Revolution, and they witnessed the local impact of the Bolshevik Revolution. Terror and hunger, men having to hide. Vatsov's eldest daughter narrowly avoided a stray or a sniper's bullet. Quite miraculous. In March 1918, following the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, the German army arrived in Tachanrog to the relief of many residents. Václav heard that the house in Borki had survived and was allowed to return home with his family. The house was denuded and the estate largely neglected. Václav had to start everything from scratch. Here they are in 1919. They now have a third daughter added to the collection born in Tahanrog. One of the, as a result of the armistice of 1918, the Germans had to evacuate Russia. Borki soon found itself in a war zone between resurgent Poland and Bolshevik Russia. In May 1919, Polish troops arrived, but in July 1920, 
During the advance in Warsaw, the Bolsheviks occupied the Borki area. Red Army soldiers slept on the floor in the house, but the family was not threatened. Vatsov and his wife spoke calmly to the soldiers. One soldier, fond of music, asked, even asked Zofia to play some Chopin on the piano. The behavior of the Bolsheviks worsened after their defeat east of Warsaw. They hunted landowners and were looking for Václav the Barin, the squire. He spent many days hiding in a boat among the reeds in a lake near the house. Only at night did he come out. His sister Salomea was then in Borki, walked around barefoot pretending to be a peasant. But the ten-year-old nephew Leos, being unafraid as small boys can be, cut the Red Army's telephone wires. There was social unrest in the area. Some peasants were armed by the Bolsheviks. Vatsov had to warn the villagers that if anything happened to him, his nephews who were in the Polish army would burn down their village. There was great joy when Polish lancers in late August arrived, but what followed was a period of anarchy and banditry, most notorious with two bandits, Mucha and Komar, <laughs> the fly and the gnat, or the mosquito. The manor was supplied with several rifles by the district authorities until all the bandits had been caught by the police and by the army. The proper re recovery of the state was only possible after the Treaty of Riga when Borki found itself within the frontiers of the reborn Polish state. The region with its finely balanced and mixed social and ethnic composition then settled down gradually to a period of stability. Soon after the war, a railway wagon arrived with humanitarian aid for the local population, part of the extensive American program of relief organized by Herbert Hoover and directed especially to the impoverished eastern borderlands. Wilson may have known nothing about the east, but Hoover did. The end of the Siberian El Dorado. In early October 1917, brothers Wilhelm, Antoni, and Narcis were still in Siberia. In what was probably his last letter to Václav from Tomsk, dated the 11th of October 1917, Wilhelm described how both he and Antoni were winding down the business and selling their assets. Wilhelm then hoped to go for a rest in the Caucasus or in the Crimea. Those were the days. But his holiday was not to be. A fortnight after this letter, the Bolsheviks launched a coup against the provisional government, and soon the three brothers found themselves trapped in Siberia. Wilhelm was eventually arrested by the Bolsheviks and was to die in a Cheka prison in 1921. Nazis died in unknown circumstances and the fate of his Buryat wife is also unknown. Only Antoni managed to escape with his life, although his health was seriously undermined by a spell in the Bolshevik prison. Batsov's family responsibilities increased and surviving family members rallied round. There was assistance for Wilhelm's wife soon to be a widow, who with her four sons managed to leave Moscow in January 1919 and return to Vilna. And Vatsov took care of Nazis' young orphan son, Leos, the one who cut the wires. Developments in Vilna, Vilnius. While Wilhelm was languishing in a Cheka prison, at least two of his sons, Kajo, age 23, and Zygmunt, age 20, fought as volunteers in April 1919 against the Bolsheviks for the control of the, of the city. Both were wounded and ended up in a hospital where the aunt, Maria Shvetskevich, happened to be in charge of feeding the wounded. Kajo's hand wound was serious enough for him to be sent to Warsaw for treatment. Zygmunt was shot through the calf. Here are the two characters, Zygmunt and Kajo. Zygmunt joined the 3rd Light Cavalry for Leisure Regiment and was promoted to lieutenant. He ended the war near Dunaburg as something of a war hero. He was decorated twice with the Cross of Valor and then with the Virtuti Militari Silver Fifth Class, the latter received personally from Marshal Piłsudski. He was then 21. This photo, of course, is much later. Kajo, in his turn, was promoted in 1920 to sergeant and was attached to the 85th Vilno Infantry Regiment. He was put in charge of supply columns because his damaged hand disqualified him from combat duties. His regiment was part of the alleged, allegedly mutinous Lithuanian-Belarusian division commanded by General Zhelyagovsky, which seized control of Vilno from the new Lithuanian Republic. And Kajo was heavily involved with the scout movement in Vilno during the existence of central Lithuania, 
one of these buildings of the federal structure that people should get in mind. How did Václav sisters in Vilna feel about the future prospects of their city? A letter written in Vilna on the 6th of December, on the eve of the occupation of the city by the Red Army, uh, by Salomea Porobinska to her brother, suggests a distinctly Polish attitude. She expressed a hope that the days of Bolshevism would not last long and, con and continued, here life is, a, is in a state of upheaval. Every hour seems to bring something new. Everyone who can is getting down to work and everyone, according to their strengths, is building Poland. She praised the revival of Polish schooling and looked forward to a time when we run our own affairs. What about Václav's youngest brother, Leon? He did not finish his studies in Lwów and joined Pilsudski's Rifleman Association, graduating from the officer school. As a second lieutenant, he served in the first brigade of the Polish legions fighting the Russians. He was in close terms with Pilsudski, who was a witness at his wedding in February 1915. To Helena Czerwijowska, the daughter of Faustin Czerwijowski, the famous librarian. Piłsudski was also godfather to their son. So here they are uh, indicated on this, old, on this photograph. Now, th this I may ask for another half minute for this, because those of you with an interest in your unusual romantic stories should not be deprived to know how Leon and Hela got engaged. Hela Czerwijowska was a friend of Piłsudski's first wife and lived in the future marshal's house. She had also recently been engaged to the writer and artist Witkiewicz, Witkacy and was still in love with him. One evening, in Pilsudski's drawing room, on the eve of the 1st Brigade's departure for the front, Leon proposed to Helena with the words, it is sad to go to war, knowing that no one will be waiting for my return. To which Helena replied immediately, I will wait for you. In her book, Marinovsky's Sisters, the anthropologist Grazina Kubitska wrote that in marrying Leon the soldier, when she was still in love with someone else, Hela Czerwijowska, quote, had, so to speak, sacrificed herself on the altar of the fatherland, a truly patriotic idea. <laughs> After the war, 929, Leon was invited by Pilsudski to administer the Belvedere during the marshal's residence there. I'm nearly there. <laughs> Life in restored Poland. The world had changed, and Václav and his surviving brothers settled down with greater or lesser success in the new Poland. Their children entered the new Polish reality. Of the younger generation, Kajo abandoned his law studies at the newly reopened University of Vilna and joined the Polish civil service. In the mid-30s, he was briefly uh, city governor of Lwów. Zygmunt, his studies in Moscow having been interrupted, resumed his studies at the Warsaw Polytechnic Institute and became a successful construction engineer. One of his achievements was the construction of the hotel Patria in Krynica, an investment project of the actor and singer Jan Kipura. It still stands. And it was through Kipura that Zygmunt met the actress Jadwiga Smusarska, whom he married in 1935. Apolloniusz, or Polik, joined the Polish Air Force to his mother's despair. We're nearly there. There he is on the left. Um, he had graduated from the Polish Air Force Cadet College in Demblin in 1929, and returned there later as an instructor. As for Leos, the orphan son of Narcis Protasevich, he was brought up in Borki, then joined the Polish army, there he is, and was commissioned in the Signal Corps, perhaps not a surprising specialization for someone who, as a 10-year-old, had been cutting Red Army telephone wires. <laughs> Concluding remarks. The empire of the Tsars, in which the Protasevichs had lived for 120 years, was no more. The younger generation, which had spent their childhood and adolescent years in the Russian Empire, fought for the new independent Poland and were now making their contribution to, the development, to its development and defense. Meanwhile, the thousands of now worthless rubles Václav had received as compensation in 1916 lay scattered in a cupboard in Borki. And as if to symbolize the end of the old order, Václav had his gold Tsarist medal melted down and turned into a large signet ring. But little could they know what trials and tribulations the family would face two decades later. Thank you. I'm sorry for the extra time.
So we uh, started a little late, so I propose to carry on for the next uh, 12 minutes uh, before we uh, break for coffee. We should still get about uh, 20 minutes for, for coffee uh, in this case. So uh, uh, please, Professor Palons. Well, these two fascinating papers actually have something in common, which isn't immediately apparent. Uh, and that is that the area which was described so beautifully by Peter Zabatsky was multi-ethnic, multi-confessional. And the towns often differed in nationality from the countryside. Borky is a good example of this. And this applies really to the very interesting paper given by Professor Gerolsky uh, Kallar. <coughs> Vilnius, Vilna, was clearly Polish and Jewish. Of course. And it was, like many other towns in the area, different in its social, in its ethnic and national composition from the surrounding countryside. I could name many towns in this situation. Lviv, Lviv is one obvious one. Bratislava, Budapest in the early years of the 19th century, Prague, and so on and so forth. And if we are to impose on this area a division into national states, which is what happened, whether it was a good or a bad thing, because it was closely questioned whether it was a good thing, and it may well be that it wasn't such a good thing, it's inevitable that the towns which differ from the surrounding countryside are going to be subjected to processes of uh, colonization, as they said in Russian, a transformation which makes them more like the surrounding the countryside. So I think that this was the problem with, with Vilna. Uh, it was clearly a Polish town with a strong Polish cultural heritage, but it was the capital of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, and it wasn't therefore surprising that the Lithuanian national movement should see it as the center of their aspirations. And I remember when he won his Nobel P uh, Prize for Literature, uh, the late Czesław Miller said he was very glad to be representing one of the smaller countries of Europe and coming from a country which history has, by and large, not been well understood in the West. And then he said, of course, I mean Lithuania. <laughs> um, so I, I think that we need to understand very sad story that you told in terms of the larger evolution of the area and uh, German policy was clearly oppressive and German policy was clearly centered on German objectives as the quotations such as the one from Beckman Holbeck which you cited clearly show but uh, from the point of view of the long evolution of history uh, I think that what happened to the School was unfortunate both for Poland and for Lithuania, and I think that both countries, and I speak as a person whose family is born in Lithuania, suffered very severely in cruels. Uh, so, I, this is an observation, but I'd like to get your reactions to this. Yes, to Pani Poli po Polsku, mogą tłumaczyć. I had only 20 minutes. <laughs> I had only 20 minutes. My paper was 110 pages in the first version. It is the first. The second, uh, the, my subject is death agony of the birth punks. And Jews not constitute their, uh, their country. Uh, I, I will speak in Polish. <laughs> it would be better in Jewish-Polish uh, question. <laughs> Wielokrotnie wypowiadałam się publicznie o tym, że było to polsko-żydowskie miasto Wilno, zdecydowanie. She has frequently publicly spoken of it being a Polish and Jewish city. Co ciekawe, momencik, jestem na finiszu opracowywania olbrzymiego diariusza z Wilna, polskiego przedstawiciela polskich demokratów, Aleksandra Szklennika. Oh, can I, uh, that uh, Professor Gierowska Kaur has uh, finished uh, the editing of an enormous uh, diary of a Polish Democrat. I uh, didn't quite catch the name, sorry. Aleksander Szklennik, <laughs> yes. And uh, i, mm, y, dzięki temu zyskałam wiedzę unikalną na temat polsko-żydowskich stosunków również. Uh, and through this, she has acquired some uh, unique knowledge, uh, including Polish-Jewish matters. Przede wszystkim, Żydzi i Polacy znakomicie współpracowali, krytycznie, byli krytycznie nastawieni i dr Wygocki, 
z Aleksandrem Szklennikiem i innymi. Nie będę sypała nazwiskami, bo to nie o to chodzi. Above all, Poles and Jews were capable of excellent cooperation. Oczywiście były kontrowersje ekonomiczne, ale to było gdzieś w tle. To nie było to główne. Economic controversies were in the background, but not in the foreground. Wszystko się zmieniło w 1917 roku. Everything changed in 1917. Przede wszystkim zachorował i umarł prezydent Wenceslawski, bardzo rozsądny prezydent miasta Wilna. President Wenceslawski. Polish president. Yes, became ill and then died. I w trzy tygodnie po rewolucji lutowej Niemcy wywieźli z Wilna doktora Wygodzkiego. I towarzystwo. And three weeks after the February Revolution, the Germans deported doktor Wygodzki. Jakub Wygodzki. To była wielka postać w tej środowisku żydowskim. Who was a great figure in the Jewish community. Bardzo mądry, rozsądny człowiek. A very wise and reasonable person. W tym momencie urywa się wątek wiedza o tym, co się dzieje w tym środowisku. And from that moment, we lose touch in terms of knowledge of what's going on in the community. Ale znam również z okresu późniejszego opracowania Aleksandra Haftki. But from Alexander Haftki's later work. O historii gminy żydowskiej w Wilnie. To jest 40 stron. On the history of the Jewish community in Vilna. I to było po prostu państwo w państwie samowystarczalne. Łącznie z własnymi fabrykami obuwia, dającymi pracę i obuwie. A self-reliant state within its state with its own shoe factories. W swoim krótkim referacie, 20 minut, in her 20 minute paper, musiałam się ograniczyć do tego, co jest najmniej znane i na co się nie patrzy. Nie było innej rady. The professor had to concentrate on the least known aspects and the most overlooked ones. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll just add a bit uh, about uh, the composition of the towns. I mean, Slonim was, before the First World War, was about half Jewish and half Belarus and Polish, whatever, actually. Very high population. And uh, the links between the manor of Borki and the local Jewish uh, merchants, communities, and so on were very, very, very considerable. I mean, they are described in... Um, there's a lot there in, in these uh, memoirs of Vatsov's eldest daughter, which are coming out next year. Bloomsbury Academic, highly recommended. The leaflets uh, flyers by the coffee. <laughs>
Okay. Uh, one more question. Would you like to make any summary? Uh, yes, please. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that at last we have a woman who has asked a question. <laughs> Would you like to comment while the map's being prepared? Um, no, I'm waiting for the map. No, I'm in, right. intrigued. No, no, I I mean, certainly uh, one could comment that somebody described General Anders's army, which came out of uh, the Soviet Union and was composed mostly of people deported from the east to the, to the Soviet interior as the last army of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania because of its composition. I mean, there were Catholics, there were Jews, there were Orthodox, the Uniates. Um, Tatars. Tatars, yes, Tatars. Oh, yes, the Tatars indeed. I, I, I must emphasize the existence of the Tatars. And um, I, I was in Belarus a few, some years ago, and in Lida it was very moving to see um, uh, variety of cemeteries, um, cemetery dedicated to Polish soldiers who had died in 1920, still re respected, and also the Tatar cemetery with inscriptions in Polish and in Arabic script or Russian and Tatar script. It's a, it's a presence which needs to be recognized, and I hope I've done this. Uh, to jest mapa, uh, Right, this is an ethnographic map from 1915. Uh, That's breast here. Uh, yeah, the Jews are shown in black. Uh, Be uh, Belarusians in yellow. Yeah, so I think that gives you a very sort of plastic picture of the, yes, yes, of the degree of intermingling. And then what we have to sort of bear in mind is that these are categories uh, which flatten people out. Uh, you may well have got people with sort of multiple identities uh, who spoke several languages depending on the context they found themselves in. Uh, and so, yes. Uh, and so, you know, whatever, whether you're using confession or language or some other marker, uh, it's always an inadequate way of uh, capturing the complexity of human beings. Uh, on that note, I think we can break. What we've done in this conference, we've, we've started with the big picture, and then we've sort of taken a trip around the edge, sort of west and south and now east. And what we'll be doing after the break is trying to see how uh, things come together uh, in the case of three uh, groups, uh, literati, uh, uh, the army, and the Roman Catholic Church.